Good evening. The Lord be with you. Amen. Welcome to our worship service this evening. For those of you joining us, perhaps for the first time, my name is Pastor David Bubbins. Welcome to St. Paul's. Glad to see you here on this wonderful, snowy Wednesday night. Although it seems the snow has, for the most part, missed us. But we were talking before the service, and I guess Duluth is getting absolutely hammered today. Nine inches so far and still going strong. Uh, that could have been us, but it's not. We'll, we'll praise God for that. Um, <laughs> uh, as is our custom during these, these midweek night services, uh, before we start tonight, are there any prayer requests that I can pray for during the prayers tonight? Doesn't have to be, don't make something up. Okay, um, yeah, we'll pray for them tonight as well. Um, our sermon tonight is going to be based off of Luke 23. I want to talk about uh, the reality of, of a complicated world, um, that sometimes we can, we tend to oversimplify things, uh, but God is still our God, and Jesus is still Lord, even in the midst of, of complicated problems, and that'll be the focus for our time together tonight. We'll follow our service as is printed. Please rise. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night in peace at the last. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and before you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore I pray, Almighty, to, to, wherefore I pray God Almighty would have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission for all your sins. Amen. Please be seated for our first hymn, number 709, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
Our reading tonight comes from Luke chapter 23, starting at verse 1. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether he was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. And so he questioned him at some length, but made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with the soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, they sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other from that very day, but before this they had been at enmity with one another. Pilate then called other chief priests and rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him, and will therefore punish and release him. But they cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city, and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! The third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I find no, in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were very urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and for murder, for whom they had asked, and he delivered Jesus over to their will. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing in our next hymn, number 428, Cross of Jesus, Cross of Sorrow.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loved you with his very life. Amen. My dear friends, let's, let's be honest. The world around us is a, it's a complicated place, and that can be hard to figure out. Like, life sometimes sends us a fair and a fair bit of pain and suffering. And when you look around, it's, it's not hard for us to spot cruelty or injustice or whatever else. Pastors become aware of this, especially when they get to walk alongside people in their sufferings. And whether you've come through a lot or been spared, we all know this. Suffering is not anything new. It's been this way since Genesis chapter 3, and it's certainly this way even right now. Now allow me to be very direct here and, and point out a problem. Sometimes, sometimes Christians talk as if the world is not complicated. Sometimes Christians like to talk as if they, they sort of have things figured out just, just by and large. And so little sayings get thrown around a lot in Christian circles and, and people do mean well and the sayings do contain truth, but, but they tend to oversimplify things and make things way simpler than they actually are. One example um, is this. I believe in the power of prayer. There is truth in that statement, of course, but, but what about the prayers to which God says no? Or, or what about the prayers that are, are met with with seemingly only silence. I've experienced this a lot in my own personal life, and I'm pretty sure you have as well. And so prayer, well, it's, it's more complicated than we like to pretend. And we don't know all we'd like to know about it or how it all fits together into God's plan. And here's another one. Um, if you like this one, I, I, I don't mean to, to hurt your feelings, but it, it goes like this. When God closes a door, he opens a window. Again, it's, it's simple and it's a hopeful thing to say, but it's, it's not in the Bible. And I understand the, the good intent behind such a saying, but it just doesn't acknowledge just how, how complicated or how, how puzzling and, and frankly how, how hard life can actually be for many, many people, including for us as Christians. And yet, even though God's ways are, are often hidden to us, still we as Christians believe that God is at work in the midst of all suffering. God is at work, and yes, we, we do believe that, and yes, we do pray in faith because the kind of God we have wants us to. And yes, even with the evil in this world around us, we trust that God is working against that evil, in spite of that evil, and sometimes even changing the purposes of evil. How God does that, I, I just not always sure, but I, I, I we, <laughs> we believe that He does. Is this kind of faith a, a blind faith? It's a, it's a pretty tall order, actually, to to ask people to believe in such a God. And the question is then, why do we believe in this God? Now, a full answer to that question would be another sermon series lasting another 10 weeks. But in a very beautiful way, the reading tonight from Luke 23 gives us our answer. It gives us our reasoning for believing in God. Tonight we're going to ponder what happened when the leaders of Israel led Jesus to stand there before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, the symbol of the oppressing authority there in Judea and Samaria. Well, what happened then? Well, the short answer is it evil, real evil, in, in different shapes and sizes, coming against the only man who ever lived, of whom it could be said he didn't deserve it. And yet all of that evil was taken up and then put to use by God, our Father, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for my good <laughs> and for your good, for the good of the whole world. And because of this, we can live as we do in a broken world, through faith with hope. And so tonight, let's look at the, the major players one at a time from this reading from Luke 23. And there are, are three major players here in tonight's text. First, we have the chief priests. We met them a few weeks ago um, in the verses that lead right up to this evening's text. 
Uh, there's evil and there's blind ignorance, their blind unbelief. They, they don't know what they're doing were the words that he said. They hated Jesus. In Jesus' ministry, he claimed authority as God's son, as the one true king, as the Messiah. He rejected the way that they taught and the way that they thought about God and about one another. They had their elevated status, and Jesus came and leveled the playing field for all people, shutting out all comparison, teaching that the only way to know the true God is in commute, complete and total humility, looking only, looking only to him, not to their own righteousness. And to Jesus, for this, for this reason and for others, the chief priests have, have spoken with one voice. They led Jesus to Pilate. They accused him of crimes against Rome, crimes against in order to bring about Roman justice. They want Pilate to think that Jesus is guilty of insurrection, and they want Pilate to execute Jesus as an usurper to the throne. But it doesn't work. They can't convince Pilate at all. Even when Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, the ruler of the Galilee in the north, the chief priests keep accusing Jesus, but nothing seems to stick. They can't convince Herod, they can't convince Pilate that Jesus deserves to die. Herod, he belittles Jesus, he mistreats him, he mocks him, but he doesn't think Jesus deserves to die. The accusations just, just don't seem to work. But that doesn't stop them. They keep coming, keep demanding, and they start, they start inciting the crowd to a riot. We would, have or have, we would rather have a murderer, Barabbas. We'd rather have an insurrectionist, a, a, a chief rioter, than this, this Jesus. Does that convince Pilate? Did, did, does he take their word for it? Well, no. He knows Jesus doesn't deserve to die. But their voices continue more persistent, pressing, pressing for what's wrong. Their blind ignorance, their unbelief, they're evil in the world. There's a second evil in the reading today, but we might be tempted to downplay it, oddly enough. And we see the second player is Pontius Pilate. He's the governor of Judea and Samaria. He is directly responsible to Caesar himself. Tiberius Caesar is, is the emperor, uh, the top dog multiplied by a thousand. And Pilate represents the interests of Rome there in that place. And the two interests that his job is to maintain are peace and taxes. We know from Pilate from other historical sources, and Pilate's made some mistakes during his years there in the Holy Land. He's learned the hard way how to be strong, how to stand up, for Jewish, stand up against Jewish convictions. He knows how to navigate the complicated pressures of being Roman in Jerusalem. It's hard to do his job, um, but Pilate has been governing for at least four years, until maybe as long as seven. But be clear about this, Pilate is in charge. He has the Roman troops at his disposal in all matters of capital crimes. Pilate has all the cards in his hands. Rome is not a pushover. Rome will not let anybody think they can do what they want. And with an insignificant, poor, non-citizen like Jesus, Pilate is all things before him. He's the prosecuting attorney, the defense attorney, the judge, the jury, the executioner. Pilate truly holds all the cards in this case. The chief priests get his attention when they accuse him of disturbing the peace and interrupting taxes. He starts insurrection. He says, we don't have to pay taxes by claiming to be a king. And it's that last one, claiming to be a king, that counts the most. And so Pilate asks Jesus point blank. Are you the king? And Jesus gives that same sort of indirect response he gave to the Sanhedrin earlier. Oh, you say so. Whenever Jesus' tone of voice, Pilate reads it as, as no. And so he says, he's not guilty. If the world were a just place, if the world were an honest place, if powerful politicians who hold all the cards always do all the right things, that would have been the end of it the world isn't that place. Politicians don't always do the right thing. And Pilate starts taking steps toward committing a great, great evil. So when Pilate hears that Jesus is from Galilee, he decides to get King Herod involved, the ruler of Galilee. And we don't know exactly what he's thinking. He's maybe looking for more information. Does he want to shift responsibility? Does he want to shift blame or whatever it is? We don't know. Whatever the reason, Herod goes off 
uh, Jesus goes off to Herod. And Herod, he's not convinced by the chief priests either. The ruler of Galilee seems to treat Jesus kind of like a, a source of entertainment, like a, a magician coming before him, like something you would see at a stage in Las Vegas. He wants to see a miracle and have, nothing, have his eyes tricked. But Jesus doesn't even speak one word to him. And so King Herod mocks him, beats him up, sends him back to Pilate. Um, and then the, other, the two rulers come together and think, oh, this other guy, maybe he's not as bad as I thought. And so where does evil now? Where is it now? It's where it was before. Pilate knows it. Herod knows it. Whatever they think, they know that Jesus does not deserve to die. But the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, they, they gather all their voices, all of their focus, and they demand death. Not any death, but crucifixion. And finally, Pilate plays all the cards that he has, the authority that only he could exercise. And he decides that Jesus is going to be crucified just like they want. And here is where we might make the mistake. We, we shrug our shoulders. We might say, oh, well, well, what did you expect? That's the way politics work, right? Powerful people do what's convenient. They compromise. They, they give in to special interests. Happens all the time, right? And so we might just shrug it off and say, what else could Pilate do? What do you expect? Well, our God expects a lot more than that from rulers, from Pontius Pilate, from governments, whatever it is. Government authorities are God's idea. And whether it's the king of Israel, the king of Moab, whether it's Pilate long ago or any official anywhere in our nation today, in God's way of looking at things, to whom has been given much, much is demanded. The Bible doesn't say a lot about it, but it does say this. The purpose of ruling authorities is to protect the weak and to protect the helpless, to protect the widow and the orphan. God has given governments responsibility of rewarding those who do right and punishing those who do wrong. And Pontius Pilate is no exception to this expectation. And just because we've come to expect this doesn't mean that Pilate gets let off the hook. Pilate has all the cards in his hands. It's his choice, his choice to send the only true innocent man to death. Rulers are supposed to protect the innocent, and there is no doubt that Pilate knows Jesus does not deserve to die. And so when Luke sees this evil thing and writes about it, this is what he says. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and for murder, for whom they had asked. He delivers Jesus over to their will. What kind of a world is that? It's the same world that we live in today. The evil of stubborn, blind resistance to God's chosen one. The evil of powerful people who know all the facts, who know what's right, and for whatever reason, they choose to do exactly what's wrong. Sins of commission, sins of omission. It was their world back then, and it's our world today, too. So allow me to read to you a couple verses from Acts chapter 4. The truth in these verses might be familiar. Perhaps you might have heard them, uh, maybe not. But we can still stand in awe and wonder at the kind of God that we have. Acts 4 takes place only a few weeks after Good Friday and Easter and Ascension of Pentecost. The same enemies of Jesus are now enemies of his apostles who are preaching in Jesus' name. They've arrested the apostles and threatened them and, and keep up with their own message. Here's what Luke writes in Acts chapter 4. So when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God, and they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and their peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly this city... In the city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. You anointed both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So 
did you catch it? Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, did whatever God's hand and God's plan had predetermined to take place. Was it evil? Yes. Did the powerful players do evil things? Yes. Was God surprised by it? No. In fact, he was counting on it. God takes the evil, the evil of injustice of Pilate and Herod, and uses it for good, even one that no one could see or understand. But God does. And that's the kind of God that we have. Because along with the chief priests and Pilate the governor and other major players in our readings, there is our third character of the night, Jesus. The Lord Jesus doesn't look like the Lord in these verses. The true king seems like anything but a king. Jesus looks like a, a pawn. The power has moved away from him to somebody else other, under other people's authority. He speaks once to Pilate, but otherwise is silent, standing before evil. And that's because God has not planned to stop it. God will allow the evil to take place and actually use it. Jesus is the true king, and the true king represents his people. In the ancient world, in the Bible's world, you might even say the king sums up all his people right then and there in his own person. Jesus is the people. So what happens to the king also happens to us. And who could ever have understood this while this was happening? God took the evil that the people were doing, that the people deserved, and he brought that evil against, against Jesus. God's plan was not to stop the world from acting. Jesus knew all of this was going to happen to himself, to our king, to our representative, and Jesus took it square on the shoulders. And he took it so he could take it away from us. The evil was deadly. The chief priests had their way. Pilate did the deed, and only Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were there to bury the body, to bury Jesus. The evil was strong, and it followed Jesus to the tomb. But God is stronger still. Jesus rose from the dead, leaving the evil behind, having taken away the evil from you. This is how the world is. Jesus reversed how the world is. He started a new world. You and I are part of that because we've been joined to Jesus, baptized into Christ, and we cling to our king, Jesus, the one who takes the evil and changes it and works it for good, even when nobody else can seem to figure out what's going on. Jesus knows. And so, yes, our world is a complicated place. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of confusion. And much of the time, it's probably best for us to say two things. The first is this. I don't understand how this all fits together. But I'm here for you as we walk through it together. The other thing that we say is that we believe is this. Our God is at work. Our God knows how to take the evil and to use it for good. It's not a blind faith. There's proof of it. Simply put, it's, it's Jesus. God worked good from the most evil of nights for you and for all people. God worked it through Jesus, our king, our living, reigning king. And God still does that today. Amen. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus. Please rise for prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In righteousness, I shall see you. Let us pray for the whole Christian church that our Lord God would defend her against the assaults of temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ in the word of his truth, 
Keep, we ask you, in the safety of the works of your mercy, that your church, spread through all the nations, might be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all the ministers of the word, for all vocations in the church, and for all people in God. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all your servants in your holy church, that every member of the same might truly serve you according to your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our catechumens, that our Lord God would open their hearts and the door of his mercy, that having received the remission of their sins by the washing of regeneration, they might be mindful of their baptism and evermore be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty God and Father, because you always grant growth to your church, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that rejoicing in their new birth or by the water of holy baptism, they may forever continue in the family of those whom you adopt as your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. O merciful Father in heaven, because you hold in your hand all the might of man, and because you have ordained for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do well, all the powers that exist in all nations of the world, we humbly pray your graciously to regard your servants, especially Joseph, our president, the Congress of these United States, Timothy, our governor, and all those who make and minister and judge our laws, that all who receive the sword as your ministers may bear it according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that he would deliver the world from all error, take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick and safe journey to all of those who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, may the prayers of those who in any tribulation or distress cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they might rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. We give you thanks for the recovery of Amy and Josh. We ask that you would be with Hannah as she's undergoing treatment for his cancer. And for Amanda, who's under recovery and undergoing testing for blood, clot blood clots. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside the church, that our Lord God would be pleased to deliver them from their errors, call them to faith in the true and living God and his only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and gather them into his family, the church. Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death, but the life of all, hear our prayers for all of those who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from their error, and for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for peace, that we might come to the knowledge of God's holy word and walk before him as is fitting for Christians. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, and by whose providence all things are ordered. The God of peace, the author of all concord, grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we might serve you in true fear to the praise and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for your enemies, that God would remember them in mercy and graciously grant them such things as are both needful for them and profitable for their salvation. O almighty, everlasting God, through your Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all of our enemies might be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessing upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his own goodwill. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you created and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts, we, might, we may by your grace be made ready to receive your blessing and all the fruits of the earth, whatever pertains to our bodily need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Finally, let us pray for all the things which the Lord would have us ask, saying, Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Please be seated for our closing hymn number 878, Abide With Me.